This will actually confirm the first treatment in these two expressions. And finally, these expressions are consistent with the theory of charge quantization. So everything seems to be nicely work, uh, nice fitting to each other very well. So what is the definition from this? So this well, you, is haven't done, you haven't used the subclass yet. So maybe uh, I mean, subclass can be, I mean, in the case of the club, yeah, you can rewrite the data in the right. subclass. Uh, yeah. uh, but but, but oh, is what I'm saying is that that's not a correct equation charge here? Or? Yes, in the mathemat mathematician said that expression is not correct. I mean, this, at least this expression is not correct. I mean, I would look at this, this point. Well, well, the mathematician said it's not correct. Well, that's, well, what's the, the, okay, this is the thing. <laughs> yeah, I will come to that point. So when you define this, uh, when you find this uh, correct form of this Ramon Ramon charge of the B brain oriented both planes, it seems quite it seems quite straightforward to write down the central charge or tension of this extended object and uh, wrapping some holomorphic cycles in the Calabria space, at least in the large wave limit. And the conventional form of the central charge formula of this B brain oriented both plane in the large wave limit is given by this expression. M is the world volume direction of this extended object. J is the Kelderfield form. And we put this Ramon Ramon charge of the planes and we the planes to this system. This is the conventional form of the central charge of the D-brain and we the planes. This is well established story, beautiful story. Many people believe that this is the end of the story. But as I told you earlier, uh, recently there are some mathematicians, including these people, who basically said this formula is wrong. The central charge formula, central charge formula of the D brain in large volume limit is incorrect. And they propose some new expression for the central charge of the D brain. Oops. Uh, new expression for the central charge of D brain in the large volume limit, which is given by this expression, which fairly similar to the conventional form of D brain charge, but involves a new characteristic class called the gamma class rather than this A with B. Wait, 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 when you say it's not correct, what is the criteria they use for... Uh, the mathematician? Yeah. So, I don't understand this mathematician's I mean, motivation. <laughs> Sorry for that. But only thing I know is that they compute, they go to the real descriptions, compute the period, then you can compute the central charge, and yeah, doing some inverse math and write down this expression. That's only, the only thing I know. Uh, I guess what we're saying here, uh, usually if you mm -hmm. classify the D-brain charge mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the Dirac category, it's the same that there's no well-defined map from the, the Dirac category of the later genes to, to these uh, particular characteristic classes. Uh, this one or this one? No, no, I, uh, well, maybe the previous one. Maybe, maybe yeah. that's the kind of thing. Yeah, I think maybe it's the same as just not well defined because this is based on some kind of uh, kind of class classical description mm -hmm. which you're wrapping on some some manifold. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. but do they agree in some simple cases? Um, uh, the deviation from this this expression and this expression starts from six form. So at least D two or D four brain, there's no difference. Yeah. We'll come to that point again later. So this gamma class is defined by this Euler gamma function in this way. And recently, this new expression proposed by the mathematician was confirmed by these two definite groups. Uh, he's not definite, but <laughs> <laughs> and by computing this exact hemisphere partition function of the two-dimensional day theory in two dimensions, which I want to discuss today. But this mathematician, I mean, this is fine. It seems to be correct, but it's still very confusing to me. Uh, well, it was very confusing to me for many reasons. In particular, uh, when I look at this conventional form of the central charge of D brain in the large volume limit, if I believe this expression, it's likely to take uh, this part as a new expression of the Ramon Ramon charge of the D brain, which is given by this expression which seems to be different to the conventional form of the different charge. Then the obvious question we can address at this point is that whether or not this new expression satisfies this anomaly inflow condition. 
for their charge quantization conditions and many other physical constraints. But surprisingly, this new expression also satisfies all these kinds of conditions. So there's nothing more I can say. But still, identifying these expressions as a new definition of the p in charge seems quite problematic. This is because, oh, sorry, because this, uh, by definition, this gamma class contains imaginary terms. Therefore, this well-known among charge of the D-brain and the best human coupling of this D-brain inevitably contains an imaginary term, which seems to break many good physical symmetry, like a PPT invariance and so on. So it doesn't make sense at all. So I was totally confused at this time, and there was the motivation to study m 2 partition functions and RP2 partition functions more carefully. Uh, sorry, you said he agrees with Abel Spina's expression up to six forms. Uh, no, four forms. Up to four forms. Yeah. Uh, where, where did this imaginary term show up? Uh, the six forms. <laughs> did you say uh, it has uh, we meant we x to the six? Sorry, x x is x. Uh, x to the cube. Power. X cube. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, previously we only want even even powers of x. X. Cube. In the previous case, there is only even power there. Ah. But this gamma class contains all power two. <laughs> it's very confusing. Yeah. Okay. So then, first of all, if you just calculate, say, three graviton vertex operator on the disk and the cube, you should be able to. This is not done yet. That's okay. the problem. I okay. mean, people only compute one graviton. I mean, this uh, one normal vertex or two. Um, yeah, it, 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 yeah, they confirm the four form contribution of the four form contribution, okay. not the six form. Any other questions? OK, so let me discuss about this. This was metric theory on this hemisphere. When did I start? Um, two. Uh, you have one more hour. OK. So first of all, we need to define and or construct a supersymmetric theory on this hemisphere. Well, this is not that difficult. We just need to start from the supersymmetric theory on the two sphere, or we construct it in the room. Then cut this two sphere by half. But this is not the end of the story because we have a boundary of this hemisphere. So in order to define the supersymmetric theory in this hemisphere, we also need to specify the boundary data. So what are these boundary data? Well, first of all, we need to impose either Neumann or Dirichlet boundary condition on various various fields in the theory, in the box. And the second, in order to preserve the two supercharges on this hemisphere, we also need to introduce some interaction from the boundary. First of all, um, we need to introduce some chump pattern vector space in the boundary. So it's a kind of string theory one on one. This endpoint of the string carries some electric charge load. This is for that. And the second, we need to introduce a certain Fermi operator acting on this chump pattern vector space. And this Fermi operator is called the Cartier profile that is by this equation, where W uh, can be identified as a superpotential of the theory in the box. This equation is known as the metric factorization, and it is known that the solution to this equation is not unique. So depending on the solution to this metric factorization, we may end up with non-trivial interaction in the boundary, which is given by anti-commutation relation between this Cartier profile Q and its commission conjugate, which is a positive definite. And this potential will describe a certain physical process, which is known as the Cartier condensation. So to get more familiar with this boundary data thing, let me try to describe the D-brain shown in this figure. Well, obviously, we, uh, we have to impose this Neumann boundary condition, which is given by this expression, for the scalar field describing the tangential duration to this D-brain. However, for the scalar field describing this normal duration to the D-brain, we have uh, two options. First, we can impose the Dirichlet boundary condition on this scalar field describing the normal duration to the D brain, which can be given by this expression. But this is very intuitive, and this is what we learned from the textbook. However, this de description sometimes becomes very subtle, especially when this D brain is wrapping on some thumb manifold, which is not thin, but thin C manifold. And that sort of thing is known as the free Fitton anomaly. <coughs> And to cure this uh, free between anomaly, we need to introduce some fake line boundary on the D-brain and so on and so forth. But today, I won't discuss much about this, uh, this uh, issue. 
So because of that, in modern different physics, people prefer to use the second description, which is the following. So now we enforce the Neumann boundary condition of the scalar field, given uh, scalar field, uh, given the scalar field describing the Neumann division to the Dibert. And then introduce some non-trivial tactical profile on the boundary, which can induce some interactions or potential term in the boundary. And this boundary potential can be minimized exactly where the Dibert is located, which can be summarized in this equation. So it's a kind of dynamical way to impose this Dirichlet boundary condition. <coughs> and since this is a physical process, some sort of thing that arises here can be automatically taken care of. Okay, so this is the description what I want to use from here on today. And from these two supercharges survived on this hemisphere, we can also show that this D brain has to wrap on some holomorphic cycle in this Calabria manifold. In other words, it's a D brain. All right, so we have uh, some supersymmetric theory. Is there any questions? Is there any questions? Okay, so we have uh, some supersymmetric theory in this hemisphere with a certain boundary data. Then, let's do the path integral exactly using the localization technique again. So it's done by this group, and the exact hemisphere partition function of this K theory in two dimension is given by this expression. W is again the bio group. Uh, integral over some vacuum expectation value of the scalar field in the better mode set. We have a classical action contribution here. Tau is the complex by FI parameter, real FI parameter, two-dimensional FI parameter. And we have a contribution from this boundary degree field freedom, champion from vector space, where rho star and r star represent the U1 gain charge and U1 r charge of this boundary degree field freedom. And finally, we have one new determinant from the vector mode flat and the carrier mode flat the ball, which is given by this expression. So this is an exact answer. And then one can ask the following question. What does this uh, hemisphere partition function compute in the string theory? Well, <coughs> quite analogous to the two-sphere partition function story, uh, one can show that we can, I mean, one can show that this, uh, we can squash this hemisphere. We can squash this hemisphere without changing this hemisphere partition function result. So it's independent of squashing parameter again. So and by taking the infinite squashing limit, uh, we can uh, we can argue that the path integral of the theory defined on this infinitely long, infinitely straight figure-like geometry as uh, inner product between the canonical ground state and the boundary state. And of course, in order to do this squashing, you need to turn, you need to turn on some background gauge to compute the U1 R U1 R symmetric one. And because of that, one can show that these two states are in the Ramon set. And then it, then it's been shown by Oguri or Yin that this particular inner product will actually compute the central charge, the roughly speaking tension of the D brain wrapping on some holomorphic cycles in this Calabria manifold. And this is an exact answer with respect to alpha prime correction, which includes all kinds of version instant correction. Okay, so to be more concrete, let's work at the simplest example. The D brain wrapping on some cycles in this Calabria n minus two dimensional Calabria hypersurface embedded in the DT n minus one manifold. So let me first discuss about the gauge linear sigma model, which describes this particular Calabria state, which can be given by U1 gauge theory. Uh, coupled to n caramels that <coughs> carrying electric charge plus one and a single caramels that p of electric charge minus n. So we also introduce fi parameter and theta angle as usual. And finally, we add to the theory the following superpotential p times the homogeneous polynomial of degree n of this caramels that x. So when, when you set n equal to five, this is nothing but the gauge linear sigma model for the twin tip three force what we discussed in the beginning of this course. <coughs> so let me think about the simplest example first, which is the space stealing D brain. D brain wrapping on the entire this Calabria manifold embedded in the DTM minus one. So in this case, we don't need to consider any non-trivial tectum profile. It's a simple profile, the tectum profile is 
enough. And then uh, using this exact formula here, we can compute this hemisphere partition function of this gate theory, u1 gate theory describing this Canadian manifold, which is given by this expression. And this is the integration control. So this one will compute the exact central charge of this particular D ring, which includes the all kinds of ordinary interpretation. Since we are interested in the geometric phase of this theory, we set FI parameter positive so that we can close this contour to the left. And then we can rewrite this integral, or we can evaluate this integral as a sum of the residue at these poles. And furthermore, we can identify that the residue at these negative integers will correspond to the non perturbative correction to this uh, central charge or hemisphere partition function because they contain a certain power of so this e to the minus 2 sheet, which is the instant effect. On the other hand, we can identify the residue at the origin as a perturbative correction to this central charge, which is given by this expression. And then, by taking the large volume limit of this Canadian manifold, where this FI parameter goes to infinity, we, we can suppress this non perturbative correction completely. And then, using this toric device of the CPM minus 1 space satisfying this relation, uh, this X is the Canadian manifold, we can rewrite this expression into the following form. And this is the central charge formula of this particular D ring in the large volume. And as you can see, this new central charge formula actually involves the gamma class rather than the alien theory. We can do the similar computations for the lower dimensional D ring wrapping on some holomorphic cycles in this Calabrian manifold by considering some different uh, boundary conditions and the different spectrum profile. Then, using this exact formula, we can compute the two step uh, sorry, hemisphere partition function of this gate in the Sigma model with that boundary data. Mm -hmm. And by taking by taking this large volume limit, we can finally obtain the following expression, which is the central charge formula of this particular D brain, wrapping some holomorphic cycles in this Calabria manifold, which is given by this expression. And again, it's fairly similar to the conventional form, except the ratio of the gamma class rather than rate of behavior. So somehow this, this result confirms this proposal by mathematicians that the central charge really involves this gamma class rather than a with So any questions so far? There is no sum over monopole? Instant one or monopole? What is uh, the monopole? <laughs> sphere, there, there was a... I mean the slope sum. Yeah. This uh, everything is all about the Ah, uh, this contribution corresponds to this non perturbative case. Uh, maybe I, yeah, I missed something here. So it's, oh. uh, yeah. Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, there is a monopole. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I missed, I, I made a mistake on writing this expression here. You made more well, well, central contribution. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. What was the, the thing in the second line? Or the, the, the yeah, this one is exactly the same no, no, as this no, no, one. But, but, yeah, this but, one, there is someone here. <laughs> Yeah, I missed that part. Sorry. But the second line is correct. Yeah, the second line is correct. <laughs> oh, yeah. There is a sum of of course, yeah. Thank you for this. Oh. <laughs> I think I made the same mistake in Orient for <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. Okay, so it's right. But we can, yeah. So now we confirm this gamma class appearance in the central charge. Was really confusing, at least to me. Then there is some. Uh, then one can naturally ask the following question: What about the wind force plane? Do we need a similar modification in the central charge of this wind force plane? If, if, if this is the case, what kind of characteristics have appeared in this modified expression? And what's the physics behind that modification? So, in order to answer this kind of question, let me discuss about this uh, RP2 partition function. Of course, first we need to construct a theory on this RP2 space. Again, the starting point is this supersymmetric theory on the two sphere. Then we employ some parity projection conditions on the various sphere of the theory, where this parity will identify the point on two sphere to its antipolar point, so that this principle can become RP2 space. 
So more precisely, we will impose the parity co uh, projection condition on the scalar field in terms of the transition duration like this. And we will impose the parity projection condition on the scalar field describing the normal duration to be doing to plane like this. Okay, we can show that uh, on this RT2 state, we can have two supercharges. And using these two supercharges and this parity projection condition on the scalar field, we can unambiguously determine the parity projection condition on the rest of the field, like a flow meter field. And using these supercharges, one can further argue that this oriented flow plane has to wrap into holomorphic cycles in this Calabria manifold. Again, this is B-type oriented flow plane. Furthermore, one can argue that on this RT2 state, the theta angle has to be either 0 or pi. This is because otherwise the polar spectrum I mean this coupling otherwise this polar spectrum will break the pair symmetry so only when the uh, pi at that equal to zero or pi we can preserve the pair symmetry so that we can define the theory of the artistic state and these two values, 0 and pi, will distinguish two different types of the oriented flow plane, O plus and O minus plane. So we have a supersymmetric theory. I'm too fast. <laughs> <laughs> I have assumed supersymmetric theory on this RT2 space. Uh, sorry, supersymmetric theory on this RT2 space. And then again, using the supersymmetric localization technique, we can compute the exact RT2 partition function of this supersymmetric theory, which is given by this expression. <coughs> so one difference compared to this two to partition function is that here we have two different type of data point configuration. One is called the even holonomy and other, the, uh, the other is called the odd holonomy. This is because uh, on this RT2 space, we have a discrete holonomy group along the non-contractable cycles on this RT2 space. So anyway, so this is the exact answer for this RT2 partition function. W is again the bi group, the gauge group, integral over some vacuum extension value of the scalar field. We have a slash selection contribution where C is a five parameter, and we have a one determinant around each of these data point configuration, even holonomy, not holonomy, given by this two expression. And the relative sign between these two different data points can be determined by the value of the theta angle 0 over pi. All right, <coughs> so this is the exact answer. And then when the obvious question we can ask is, what does this exact RT2 partition function compute in the string theory? Well, um, using the same argument I gave in the two-step partition function and hemi-step partition function, we can squash this RT2 without changing the partition function. And in the infinite quotient limit, we can identify that partition function as an inner product between the canonical ground state and the uh, closed gas state. And due to the background gauge field, this, uh, this state must be in the Ramon Ramon vector. And it's shown by Uguri and Uguri again that this particular inner product will compute the central charge of this oriented flow plane driving on the holomorphic cycles in the Calabria manifold. And again, this is the exact answer containing all kinds of words in instant operation, and we can compute it without relying on the nearest metric. <coughs> okay, so let's now work out the synthesis example again. So let me start from this oriented flow plane, working on this entire collateral space embedded in the CCM1 model. In this case, we need to impose uh, this parity projection condition on the whole of scalar field. And we obtain uh, N using this exact formula. We can compute this exact RT2 partition function of this U1 gauge theory describing this Calabrian manifold, which is given by this expression. There is other contributions here. And the integration control is given by this one. Again, we are interested in the geometric phase of this gauge theory. So we set a parameter positive. So that we can close this control to the left again. We write this integral as a sum of the radii of this code. And then by taking the large order limit, we subtract this non-partiality equation, and we are left with this uh, 
expressing that this origin, which can be understood as a pathology correction to the central charge, which is given by this expression. And finally, using this Corrick divisor, the PTM minus one state satisfying this relation, we can rewrite this expression into the following form. So this is the central charge of this orientable plane affecting this entire Calabrian state in the large volume. Oh, oh, wait. So, so previously when you mm -hmm. threw away the sum of number of terms, those were the, from the other poles. But then you say on top of that, there's also the additional flux sector contribution that, that's not even included in the first one. Uh, from which one? This uh, different case? No, I mean, in, both, in both cases. So uh, I, I guess here you have already, so you're throwing away the other poles that are not at zero. Oh, sorry. I mean, no, yeah. I, there's, there's no fluxes. Sorry. Yeah, I completely forgot. Yeah. yeah. And, and why is there no fluxes? Oh, on this side, I mean, when you throw the uh, telephone expression, this S has to be zero. Uh, yeah, boundary condition. Uh, and also parity projection condition. The D is also always zero. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Right. So this is the central charge formula of this orientable plane in the large volume limit. Fairly similar to the conventional form, but it doesn't involve the Hilsburg class, rather it involves the gamma class. So we need a modification in the central charge, even for the orientable plane. We can do similar computation for this lower dimensional orientable plane by importing different parity projection conditions in the scalar field. Do the same computation, take in the large volume limit, we obtain this expression. This is the central charge formula of this orientable plane. We can reproduce this important factor for the test for cancellation, plus minus for different type of orientable plane. We have right sector here, but we don't have ratio that Hilsburg class. This expression involves the ratio of the gamma class and the A of sigma. So these results tell us that we need a similar modification in the central charge of the orientable plane. But still, it's quite confusing. Any questions so far? So you, you were complaining about that term, X cube term. Is that if you look at a Lorentzian action, you say it's not and if I identify, uh, if I mean, believe their proposal, I mean. In purity, from the, the level of Euclidean action, it was, it's okay to have the measure part, but yeah. somehow you want to demand that. Yeah. Uh, we just confirmed that this central charge formula is correct, but it's not clear yet whether this really implies this modification of the charge. This is the part of what, what I want to discuss on that. Okay, so I think we are now ready to discuss how to understand this modification in the central charge and the, what's the physics behind this modification. So to do that, uh, in order to do that, we first understand how much this new expression is different to the conventional form of the d ring central charge and the range for central charge. So let me now start from this deep central charge formula for the d ring in the large ring limit, which is given by this expression, as I explained to you just before. <coughs> Here, by using this identity between the gamma class and the A of genus, and using some assumption formula, we can easily rewrite this expression into the following form. This is the conventional form of the central charge of the D-brain in the large room limit. And this is the deviation formula. Let's now move on to the central charge of the orientable plane, which is given by this expression. Again, using this identity between the gamma class and the A of genus, and A of genus and the uh, identity between the A of genus and this group class, we can rewrite this expression into the following form. This is the conventional form of the central charge of the orientable plane in the large volume limit. And surprisingly, we have the same deviation factor here. It's very interesting, so we will take a closer look at this common factors in these two uh, expressions. This correction from the gamma class can be nicely rewritten into the following form. So here, it is important to note that the all terms that appears in this exponent are actually purely imaginary. This is very important. And in the case of the Calabria manifold, we don't have first term. So this correction from the gamma class actually starts from the sixth form contribution. So in order to see this difference,